there was a wedding that I got to uh, minister a couple years ago for a young couple. And I remember, I can't remember what happened, but in the middle of it, and this gal, the one thing she was afraid of was that there'd be an awkward moment in the wedding. And I can't remember what happened, but there was this long silence. And I, I just looked over at her and smiled and uh, said something. Oh, man. Awkwardness in church. It's a good thing. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11 is where we'll be camped out today. You can follow along on the screens. If you have a Bible app, you can use that. If you don't have a Bible app, or if you, even if you don't have a Bible, Bible apps are, are free, and there's a lot of great ones. You can get uh, a good version of the Bible and follow along there. But we've been asking why Jesus matters today. Why does Jesus matter today? And today we're going to see Jesus gives us an appetite for heaven. I think about my appetite and my hunger in an ordinary day. I am a privileged American middle-class person who can wake up and eat what I want in the morning. And so what I usually want in the morning are some eggs, some sausage, wrapped in a tortilla with some hot sauce on it. It's delicious. And I get off to the day, I curb that morning craving. And then I get a little further in the day, maybe about halfway through the morning, I'm starting to feel that tinge of hunger. So I can reach in a drawer and I can pull out a little snack and I can stave off the hunger pangs. Lunch, afternoon repeat, dinner comes. Now the worst thing will happen if Christina lets me go to the store and I go there hungry. I shouldn't go there at all because I'm a terrible spender. But if I go there hungry, I'm just a hot mess. I'm going to come home with Funyuns. I'm going to come home with like potato chips and barbecue sauce. Have you ever had potato chips? Plain Lay's potato chips and barbecue sauce. So salty, so good. You know? We love that salt and sweetness crunching in my mouth. How do you act, though, when you're really hungry? when you can't instantly scratch the itch. We have a, a new word that's uh, been used maybe for the last 10 or 15 years, hangry, hangry. You could find a long line of Twitter uh, posts about it, hashtag hangry. What happens? There's part of our humanity that's exposed in that moment. We can become an angry person. We're more quick to anger. We might not make as rational of decisions because we were made as limited creatures to eat and to live on things that help us to have energy, help our bodies to function. But something happens to us, and I think particularly us in the West, who have a lot of privilege, who don't have to worry about where our next meal will, will come from, we really like fast food fixes, and not just for our hunger. We like it for our soul. We want our soulish cravings to be satisfied with salt. We want good, salty stuff. We want good, salty entertainment. Think about the way we use our time. We want to be entertained. Somebody interrupts us with a need at home when we're watching our favorite show. What happens? You know? It's not just entertainment. It can be relationships. We want good, easy, salty relationship. It's fun. It's exciting. That's why I think some of our neighbors may not have the longevity to endure long friendships and long marriages. Because inevitably, relationships aren't always exciting, salty, fun, instantly gratifying. Love is hard. And so this pattern of loving fast food fixes, it makes us easy targets, the Bible says. And here's where it gets interesting, particularly for some of our neighbors, because we're easy targets for the devil, The devil, you may wonder, what about him? Well, uh, before we go there, this passage, as we, as we dig into it, we're going to see Jesus came 
to give us a new kind of appetite, an appetite for heaven. And we need him to do that. But why? We'll talk about that. And then what does it have to do with us today? How do we learn to hunger like he hungers? Before we can get there, though, we need to ask this question, this first question, what about the devil? Because it says in chapter four, verse one, that Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In the first century Jewish audience, you probably wouldn't have questioned whether or not a devil existed. In a 21st century American audience, there are a lot of people questioning. Probably some of you today have questions. Certainly our neighbors, friends, family members have questions. As a matter of fact, there was a poll that Barna took in 2009 and found that 40% of people who identify as Christians would strongly agree with the statement that Satan is not a living being, but is a symbol of evil. Four out of, four out of 10 Christians. It was only a minority of Christians that said they believe Satan is real. And then about 8% were not sure. So if you're anywhere in that mix, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> we're, we're learning to follow Jesus together. We're looking to him imperfectly. And I'm right in that mix with you. But what does the Bible actually say about the devil? What does the Bible say about the devil? He goes back to the beginning of the story and in the most uh, ancient of uh, the Old Testament documents in Job, he appears as the Satan, the adversary, the adversary. And he afflicts Job with terrible afflictions. But he doesn't do so willy-nilly. He doesn't have power that's equal with God. He only has power within what God permits. He is not equal with God. That is very clear. Christian tradition and later scriptures like Jude will talk about fallen angels. And it seems as though Satan would be one of those, a fallen angel. That means he's a creature. He is not infinite in knowledge. He's not infinite in presence omnipresence, he's not everywhere. Not even infinite in knowledge, though he probably knows more than us. He does know the scriptures, as we'll see. But what does he do? We find in the Old Testament, he tempted David, a king, to trust in himself, to trust in his own knowledge. And when he was forbidden to take a census of his army, that may sound silly, but this is sort of an action that showed that he wasn't going to trust in the Lord to protect his people. He needed to take it into his own hands. And so when David took a census of his army, he was ten tempted to do so by the devil. In Zechariah chapter three, that's a, a later prophecy near the end of your Old Testament. You see the, the devil accusing. That's another posture the devil would take. He will accuse God's people. Even the high priest even the professional religious person can feel accused by the devil. 1 John 3, 8, it says the devil sinned from the beginning. And we see that at the very beginning of the story in Genesis chapter 3, a serpent slithers in and tempts Eve to eat a fruit, tells her that God is hiding pleasure from her. There's something more, more wisdom for her to have. She'll just eat, and she eats, gives it to her husband who's with her, and he eats, and everything unravels, and sin enters the world. But God makes a promise, actually to the serpent himself, that from Eve would come an offspring who would crush his head. And we find in Romans 16, 20, the promise, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So this work is coming. The New Testament speaks a lot more about the devil says in 2 Corinthians 11, he, he's cunning. He disguises himself as an angel of light. Church tradition, of course, said he was a fallen angel and uh, would even, in, in the Latin translation of Isaiah 14, you'll find the name Lucifer. So that's a name perhaps. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that right now. But it fits with this idea that he would hide himself as an angel of light because Lucifer means morning star. He prowls a lot around like a roaring lion, seeking those whom he should devour, 1 Peter chapter 5. 
And in context, you should note, he's not, it's not like a literal physical line. He's using a metaphor. And in the context, he's talking about a church that struggles with humility and struggles with being humbled under the mighty hand of God altogether, elders and young people together, seeking to follow Jesus humbly. And when that humility was absent, that's one of those moments where the devil's prowling around, picking off people, where pride rules. He can cause physical harm, it seems. Luke chapter 13, 16, there's a dear woman who's been struggling for 18 years with some sort of physical bondage. We don't know what it is, but Jesus heals her on a Sabbath day. And of course, the religious people are mad because he healed her on the Sabbath day. And Jesus says, shouldn't she, a daughter of Abraham, be freed from this bondage on the Sabbath day? So the devil can manifest in physical forms and physical torment, but more often it's subtle, is what the scriptures say. And that's what we see here in Matthew chapter four and in Luke four, where Jesus and his temptation also occurs there. It's more like with, uh, with Peter, that's one good example of this subtleness, this subtlety, because Peter doesn't want Jesus to be the kind of Messiah he came to be. He wants him to be a conqueror. He wants him to elevate the cultural power of the Jewish people because they're in subjugation to the Romans at this time. He wants to see the king come and clean house. And when Jesus says, I'm coming to die, to be mocked, to suffer, die on the third day to rise again. Peter takes him aside and says, no, he rebukes the Lord. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Because that's where Satan works, is in those subtle ways. Popular culture is still fascinated with the devil and Many of our neighbors today dabble in the occult. There's been a rise in occultism. Some of our neighbors would be more prone to believe in the devil than they would in the creator of heaven and earth, that there is one God, that there is a devil might make more sense to them. But there'd be an honest objection that would come out from us, uh, from our neighbors, maybe from you. Why, why, God, would you allow this devil to exist? Why is this even a part of the story at all? And here a, a preacher is limited. We can say very limited things like at times the Lord uses the wreckage that the devil wreaks for good in the end. First Corinthians five, a person who has devilish desires might be turned over to Satan that they might ultimately be won back to the fellowship because when you see how empty and worthless these salty things the devil promises are, maybe you would be won back to true goodness and true treasure. That's 1 Corinthians 5. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul speaks of a, a messenger from Satan that's like a thorn in his flesh, constantly getting him down. But the result of this is that he sees that Christ is enough. Your grace is sufficient for me. So he comes into deeper communion with God through this. But those, those little hints aren't enough to answer our question, and I ultimately have to say, I don't know. It's God's plan, and it's his story. And we know that he will lose in the end. The devil has been bound since Christ's resurrection. The gospel will spread free of his resistance because Christ the King has come. I will say this though, that although I can't give the theological answer, I can say that there is an explanatory power that the existence of the devil gives in this very real world. There's a, a scholar named Craig Keener. He was writing a commentary on the book of Acts. And um, as a scholar, he's not allowed by the rules of the academy to use a miracle as an explanation for something that happened in history. And so he put a footnote under the little occurrence of some miracle in the story of Acts, that there's not yet been an adequate treatment of miracles in history. And then he wrote a 900 plus page uh, follow-up to his footnote called Miracles. 
and he recorded accounts of miracles from the ancient world to the present. And one section in there are claims of people who have encountered the devil. There's a moment where a man in Africa in 1987, he goes by Papa, I'm going to say it wrong, Bisuesu. Someone can correct me later. He's from Brazzaville in the Congo. And I'm going to call him Papa B to help myself out. Papa B had a man come to him. Papa B was a leader in the Catholic Church there. And the man came to him burdened, wanting to confess because he had promised himself to the spirit that a local cult worshipped. And he had promised his life that the spirit could take his life on a certain date and time, provided that that spirit would give him a good life until then. He wanted happiness and prosperity for his family. They don't have King Supers and Safeway and easy access to all the food that we have. He's really asking for daily bread and a good life, right? And he asked that of the Spirit, and apparently he got it for a time. But then when his death was coming soon, it seemed, and that day was coming, he goes to Papa B, and Papa B tells him that Jesus Christ could free him from this evil bondage. And so the man goes and gets all the items related to this cultic worship, brings it to Papa B. Papa B burns it. And the man goes home. Well, the night comes. And Papa B recounted in an interview that that night he and his wife experienced a deep spiritual battle. And Papa B says that he witnessed the devil himself. But they were crying out to Jesus and the time passed with no harm to the man who quickly entrusted himself to Christ and today is an influential leader in the Roman Catholic parish of Brazzaville. Now, I can't prove to you that that story is true. But I can say that that's the experience Papa B has and that he related in good faith. And perhaps one of the reasons why we or our neighbors may be less inclined to believe that there's a devil or that an account like this could be true is because of a sense of cultural superiority. Oh, well, they believe that because they're just not as developed or sophisticated as us. I would just caution that kind of a thought. That sort of pride, that dismissiveness. Are you really, really sure? And plus that keeps you from actually looking into it. It's just a a way of not listening to a neighbor and dismissing them. It in fact would make you dismiss Jesus because he is a culturally different person from most of us. And he believed in the devil. That's why he related this story that we're about to read now. And so I just invite you, if you have questions about the devil, to continue to ask them with me. But you can raise them up to Jesus now. Because Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. Why do we need Jesus, the Son of God's appetite for heaven? We need the Son of God's appetite for heaven because we love salty stuff. But first, before we really get into that, I want us to think about what it means that Jesus is the Son of God. In Matthew 3.16, right before this passage, what happened? The heavens opened up and a voice from heaven declared, you are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is the son of God. There's that direct divine relationship. And we know from chapter one, verse 23, that means that he is God with us. This Jesus is the one who is born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He is true God of true God fully God and yet fully human. But here we see another emphasis on his sonship, and it's the emphasis that we heard earlier in chapter two, out of Egypt I called my son. Remember in Hosea 11 verse one, he's talking about Israel, God's people, relates to God together as father and God to them as his son. And Israel, 
the thing that you have to know about them, part of their story was that they were in the wilderness right after God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. And in the wilderness, God related to them good laws for them to live, told them who he was, how to follow him, and they failed time and again. And then as they were preparing to enter into the land that God promised for them, God reiterated his commands, reiterated his promises to them, and called them to trust in him, to not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from his mouth, to not put him to the test, to worship him and him alone. And Jesus, we find, is meditating on these very promises and on this moment in his people's history because he came to fulfill their story, to give them a new kind of hunger and for all the moments that they failed to cover that with his righteousness. So when the tempter came and said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. In essence saying, you can be comfortable right now. You can scratch this itch right now because you have the power to do it. But that's not how he's going to use his messianic power and privilege He's going to come and fulfill his people's story. And so he says from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Where they had failed and gone after salty things time and again, Jesus overcame. In verse 5, the devil then took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written in Psalm 91, again, the devil knows scripture, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they'll bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Imagine the arrival. Imagine, you know, coming into Jerusalem with style, jumping off the temple and safe. Messiah is here. The relevance, the immediate access to everyone's attention. But Jesus is coming not for his own cultural relevance, but he's coming on a mission from the Father. And furthermore, he's not going to put the Lord as God to the test. Because that's what's written in Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. And then again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And there's no mountain in this region, so it's very likely a vision that the devil uh, gave to Jesus, but nevertheless, in verse nine, the devil says, all these I'll give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Now, many of us reading this, especially if we've read it a, a hundred times in our life, we just think, oh, that's so obvious. Jesus would never go for that. But remember whose story Jesus is coming to fulfill because the people whose story he came to fulfill were duped by that time. And again, you read in your Old Testament, the time when Pharaoh Necho offers a sense of shelter from God's people, when they had enemies coming from the east that were going to conquer them. They think they can relate to another earthly power and find cultural power and privilege there. If only we will bend the way we worship and bend our trust in God to trust a little more in that earthly power. And they do it time and again. There's something called the Maccabean Revolt and the Hasmonean Dynasty, and they put their faith in the sword. Some of the first century Jewish people would put their faith in Roman power and would try to find a way to ally their religious faith and religious factions with Roman power. Others would try to uh, relate with other Jews who wanted to have power against the Romans. They were called the Zealots, and they would try to take arms against the Romans, and they'd put their faith in this power, this cultural power, all the way down to today when someone would offer us, Christians, some cultural power or privilege and we eat out of their hands. If only you'll worship me, I'll give it to you, they'll say. But Jesus, Jesus saw him for who he was. Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him. The first thing you have to realize if you would want to apply this passage 
is not to go and be like Jesus and fast for 40 days and resist every temptation. That's not the first thing that we do. The first thing that we do is we see Jesus, the Son of God, overcame for us in a way we never could have. Jesus overcame the temptation to be comfortable when God was calling him to hunger. Jesus overcame the temptation to be relevant when God was calling him out on his own in the wilderness. Jesus overcame the temptation to earthly power because he knew that on the other side of the cross, all authority in heaven and on earth would be given to him rightly. And you shall worship the Lord your God alone. We fail at all of these, and we will again tomorrow and the next day. So the first thing we do when we come to this passage is we see who is on the page, Jesus, who conquered the devil. And he's the only one who could. He is the son of God. I am not the Christ. We are half-hearted creatures, C.S. Lewis wrote, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased. But Jesus, Jesus saw something in God that was worthy. And he lived that out on behalf of his people, fully human and fully God. And he gives us a heavenly hunger when we look to him. So we start by looking to Jesus and rejoicing in what he's done. And then, and only then, we can take a separate, second trip through the wilderness. <laughs> and we prepare and we learn to be hungry with Jesus. How do we do that? I, I think of a moment some five years ago, an ex-FBI director was invited to speak to cadets at West Point. And when he got up to speak to them, he had received an award from them. He said this, there will come a time when you'll be tested. You will face a decision that will not be an easy call. But West Point has prepared you for such a test. Imagine the people he's looking out at. And in this moment, ISIS, five years ago in particular, was, was still in a greater place of, of power regionally in the Near East, in the Northern Africa. Even today, we're hearing of that awful movement. But imagine the difficult calls that have to be made in the moment. Imagine the highest stakes, life or death situations they face. There's preparation that's necessary. You couldn't imagine West Point sending officers without preparation. But we are going out and we are facing a very high stakes reality with a very real enemy, the scriptures say. And I fear that too often Christian communities are a bit nonchalant. And we may send one another out without preparation. And so today we're invited in Jesus, the one who has overcome for us, to walk with him. And to learn a faithful hunger. The first step into this, I just invite you, is, is to not be naive, to acknowledge that there is a devil, there's a spiritual enemy. He wants to devour you and he will come at your point of weakness. He's an opportunist. Just as he came to Jesus in his weakness, 40 days he hungered alone. He will come to us. He'll come to us at nighttime when we're alone on our screen. He'll come to us in our prayer groups when we just want a little bit of gossip and so we start to share prayer requests, other people's prayer requests. He comes to us in moments in the office when we are full of, of anger against someone and we go and gossip in the office and after the office hours when we go out and we spend too much time with someone who is not our husband who's not our wife, all of these kinds of situations. 
He will get us in our weakness. That's where he would go. But in those moments, we remember and we tell ourselves and we tell one another as we've sung this morning that Jesus is our Savior who has overcome and we're united to him. That's what we say again and again. And in him, in union with him, in relationship with him, we take a step. We might take a step like scripture meditation. Note that the Bible does not tell you to take up an annual Bible reading plan. That is a good thing. Hear that. It is a good thing, but it is not a God thing. The Bible commands you to meditate upon scripture. It's our food. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So you might take a simple promise, like Jesus' promise at the very end of Matthew, simple little promise. What does he say? I am with you always to the end of the age. And in that moment, you remember the Lord Jesus is with me. The Lord Jesus is with me now. In all the challenge that that means in our deepest moment of temptation, but all the strength and hope that that means. The one who's overcome. The one who has been tempted in every way as you are, yet without sin. He gets what it's like to be really tempted. But he's overcome it for you. He bore the weight of your sins on his cross. He knows what you did and what you will do. And he's with you. You can just meditate upon a promise like that. And it might shine light on your path. And then in that night alone, suddenly there's light. Suddenly you can see the treasure you have and you can see the the cheap, fake promise that the devil would give you. And you can just go to bed because you've got enough. Another step on the path we see in Jesus is fasting. In America, we don't fast, we eat fast. But maybe, in spite of our cultural superiority, maybe this other cultural practice is something we might learn from. Jesus never commanded his disciples to fast. He assumed they did. He says, when you fast, when you fast. And then he gives some instruction on fasting. But when you fast, what happens? You're hungry. And in that moment, it exposes what you want. It exposes parts of our character that maybe we haven't let the Lord deal with yet. But at that moment, if you take a morning off from food or a day off from food, you might talk to your doctor about any longer fasts because it's not always safe. For the record, the Lord Jesus never commands anyone to do a 40-day fast. It's a very serious undertaking. But if you fast, it'll expose where your heart is. And at that moment, you can just treasure that promise. The Lord is with me always. Right now, you're with me, Jesus. And you are enough. You're enough. You're all I need. The kingdom of heaven is mine. I have treasure. And in this way, we train our appetites. We become less ruled by the instant, by the desire for salt and now. But it takes time, and it also takes community. And I want you to note this and be encouraged by this. Jesus, in his humanity, is exposed. The fullness of God in human flesh. At the end of this passage, behold, angels came and were ministering to him. There's this ongoing ministry. He was in need of a lot of care. Humanly, he was exhausted. Do you know resisting temptation is exhausting? It's exhausting. Life as a Christian is not easy. Imagine if you never got the dopamine hit of giving in. And that's what Jesus did for you. And so we go together. We need community. We need those around us to pray for us. Even Jesus, the Son of God, for a moment made himself dependent on that angelic care. But the thing that this passage ultimately calls us to prepare for is failure. 
Because why did Jesus come to do this? Why do we need his heavenly hunger? Because we hunger for junk. We want dino nuggets when he's come to give us the best steak dinner that you could imagine. He would give you himself as true food, but we miss it. And when we fail, I want you to go there for a moment, a recent moral failure, perhaps it's a past one. Go there for a second with me. I know you have it, and I do too. When you fail, the devil does something. He takes on his role as the accuser. In Psalm chapter three, David was surrounded by people, and they were saying, there's no salvation for him in God. There's no chance. And this is something that the devil will do to you. And so you won't want to pray that next day. You may not want to go back to any Christian community for a while until you feel like you've measured up a little bit. You've covered it over, you know? Because the devil's telling you that you're worthless and you're a fake. How could you go back there and pretend to be a Christian? Give me a break. And that's what he'll do. And in that moment, when you have those feelings arise, I just invite you, like Jesus, to see him for what he's doing. Be gone, Satan. Get out of here. My Lord Jesus has conquered. He has done it. You got nothing. The Lord has a hold on me. Even when you failed, even when you believed the lie that this salty thing would satisfy you, Jesus still has a hold on you and his blood was shed for you and for that moment and for the next moment. This passage prepares us to fail and know that Jesus has overcome for us and we can get up and keep walking with him and we can continue to find a deeper pleasure in him than what this world could offer. But I know that there are some of us here who have things we can't let go of and perhaps things that we even feel like it's mean for a God talker like me to tell you you have to let go of. Things that the Lord would say are killing you, are taking you away from God, taking you away from true purpose. I don't know what you're holding on to, but you know, the devil has always said that God is hiding true pleasure. That's what he said to Eve in the garden. It's what he says to people today. But do you know that he's the one who created pleasure? And we think that we know better. He has a deeper delight to offer you. One that will last so much longer. When the saltiness wears off and you grow old and you lose your sense of taste. In that moment, you still have treasure. You're not lost because you have Jesus. C.S. Lewis wrote in The Great Divorce, I believe to be sure that any man who reaches heaven will find that what he abandoned, even in plucking out his right eye, has not been lost. That the kernel of what he was really seeking, even in his most depraved wishes, will be there beyond expectation waiting for him in the high countries. The thing you're really after is God. <laughs> and he's there. And he came in Jesus to overcome for you, to give you a new kind of hunger. And the invitation today is to taste, to see that he's good. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you would enable us by your grace to see Jesus as lovely, even tasty, I pray that we could say, like one of the old timers of the faith, that, that you are a delicious good, God. Come and be with us now. We, we long to be satisfied in you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.